Hello, everyone, and welcome to Managing Data with Integrated Interoperable Mobile Devices, sponsored by NetMotion Wireless. I'm Dan Bowman, Senior Editor of Fierce Health IT and Fierce Mobile Healthcare, and I'll be moderating this webinar. Our speakers today are Dr. Shafiq Rob, VP and CIO at Hackensack University Medical Center, Dr. Christy Henderson, Chief Telehealth and Innovation Officer at the University of Mississippi Medical Center, and Steve Fallon, Senior Product Manager at NetMotion Wireless. You can read their full bios on the right side of your window. Just a few technical notes before we begin. If you have trouble reading a slide, please hold and drag the right corner of the slide window to enlarge. Please also disable your pop-up blocker to participate in the interactive parts of this presentation. We will follow the presentations with a Q&A session. Please submit your questions during or after the presentations using the Q&A box at the right of your window. Okay, now let's begin. Dr. Rob, please go ahead. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining the call. And Dan and company, thank you for allowing me to speak today. I am the Chief Information Officer for Hackensack University Medical Center. Hackensack University Medical Center is the number one hospital in the state of New Jersey. It has achieved great distinction in quality, and it is the hospital that has achieved magnet status at least five times, and I'm lucky that I work here with great people and great CEO, Mr. Bob Garrett. Today we have to speak about managing data with integrated and interoperable mobile devices. So I'll set the stage and talk a little bit about it. Feel free to ask any questions as we go along with it. So since time immemorial, you know, people have wanted information, whether it's the scrolls or whether it is the typewriter, and then computers came in, and people were gathering information one way or the other. Even the doctors, when they were trying to understand things in the olden days, they used to use their hunches. And uh, there was a time when doctors smoked camel cigarette. Now cigarette is banned. And as people move forward with it, we are still gathering information because electronic health record came in, meaningful use came in, and analytics came in. And as we are evolving, and then what happened is that from the computers, a big push came towards mobile devices, and we went through a process of sublimation. That means from desktops to directly uh, to mobility. And as you can see, before I talk about what the pressure is on it, there are about 1.6 billion people today on the Internet. By 2020, it will be more than 6 billion people uh, online. That is a big number of people uh, enjoying the Internet. One of the things that's happening in the, in the healthcare industry is that everybody wants your business. Everybody wants the, uh, your business, your money, uh, your insurance, so that you participate with that system. And everybody wants access. That means they want access whenever, however, as fast as it is. And quality is a given. That means doctors and hospitals have to have high quality health care. And then at the same time, we have to have some other benefit to distinguish ourselves, whether it is patient experience, whether it's a great hotel-like experience, or doing something to attract the patient to come to them. The stage is set because when the Obamacare came and people did the exchanges, people thought that it would fail. Well, this year, they were above by 3 million. And by 2016, 2018, 90 million people will participate in it. And as you know, that when 90 million people pay out of their pocket, they would like to have certain things from it. They want health care when they want it, how they want it, and they want it cheap. They don't want to pay extraordinary money for it. And at the same time, there's a political drive to decrease the cost of health care, as well as there is a transparency uh, to know that who provides high-quality health care and who does not. Similarly, as consumers, we would like to know about our data. We would like to know about our health care. Plus, at the same time, we would like to interact with our doctor. We would like to interact with our nurses. It's not like the olden days that the doctor came to your house with a, with a bag. And as that is going on, 
At the same time, healthcare is also shifting. It is shifting from the hospitals to primary care to ambulatory care to home. What that means is that more and more responsibility is being shifted towards the patient. Or otherwise you can say that for the first time, we are allowing the patients to participate in their healthcare and to have control over their data and to have control over their information. That is happening because of the pressure as I mentioned before. As you, as the young people would say, hey, give the value of healthcare delivered to me as perceived by me because I'm paying for it. And then of course, the, the technology is getting better and there are certain key enablers that are allowing us to, to deliver healthcare in a more efficient way. As we are going forward, so what are the infrastructure that we need to make healthcare better or the mobility better? First, as you can see, that cloud computing is becoming ubiquitous. Uh, different companies are offering cloud offering, different healthcare is happening in cloud offering, different analytics is being done in, in the cloud offering, and from there, the consumer ingests it or the consumer receives it on their mobility, on their mobile devices. As you can see, the Internet of Things is happening. Analytics has moved from descriptive to predictive and finally to prescriptive. And finally, as you can say, that they're moving to the participatory level. That means that the patient can actually participate on it. Or, as, as we call it, we're also making with the advent of genomics, personalized medicine is also happening. So to sum it up, if you look at this way, first, there is cloud computing. Second, there is device in which you can see things. Third, the data is being pushed, not only towards the patient, but the patient is pushing the data back. The patient and the, uh, there are different devices that collect information and then, then they send through the internet into the cloud so that the patient's blood sugar, the patient's blood pressure, the patient how many feet they have walked, how much exercise have they, have they have done, how much breathing they are doing, all that information is being collected. At the same time, patient also knows what his health is. So this back and forth is possible now because of the mobile devices and the Internet of Things. As I talked about, that mobility has become the norm. People who are seeing the device, this, this slide you can see people riding on camels and are also using a smartphones and a smart devices. As I mentioned earlier, that the Internet, about 1.6 billion are on now, and by 2020, it will be about 6 billion people they will join on, on that quest. So what is the idea? The idea is getting the right information at the right time for the right person in the right format securely every time to make the right decision. So what is Hackensack doing? Well, Hackensack University Medical Center has a patient portal. So what that means is that patient can access their medical record, patient can pay their bills, the usual stuff, and patient can participate. At the same time, Hackensack Medical Center also has a physician portal. But more important, one of the things that we are very proud of, we have an accountable care organization, uh, which is known as Hackensack Physician Hospital Alliance, ACO. And uh, we are one of those ACOs in the country that they were able to save $10.75 million, and we received a check of $5.27 million, which we have distributed to our, to our physicians. The question is, what did we do so unique about it? Well, we did not do anything unique. The only thing we did is that we made sure when the patients leave, they have one month of drug with them. But at the same time, we gave tablets to our care coordinators who went into the field. We also have given patient access to our portal so they can participate, ask questions, and questions answered. So it's in back and forth in both ways that has allowed us to, to make it right by the patient. Other than that, as, as we say, as Gary Gorkin said, you know, what we are doing here is not only allowing the, the patient to participate from the portal, but they can also chat. They can also do a video chat. They can also schedule their meeting. So all of a sudden, the control is in the hand of the patient. So how are we doing this? Well, there is an infrastructure behind it. 
that you need for cloud computing and, and delivering your things, but at the back end, you also have to have some form of security. So some people call it MDM, mobile data management. There are many companies who do that so that you know, things are securely trans uh, transmitted. At the same time, we are also allowing secure texting and those kind of activities so that the back and forth between the patient happens and things go smoothly. As you can see, as there are different types of uh, devices that patient wear now. There are wearable devices, there are ingestible markers, there are big uh, body posture movement that people have. All these allow us to understand different types of patients. Patients who have diabetes, patients who have congestive heart failure, the chronic diseases that are managed and maintained by it. Here is a picture of certain uh, devices that, that people do, and there's a, it's not my phrase that is coined there, somebody else coined it, that the patient will see you now. In the olden days, it was the doctor will see you now. As you can see, there is a smartphone with a thing with which you can look through the, to the, to the uh, you can look at the ears. Similarly, you can do ultrasounds, you can do EKG. All those things are available and those information are done. Sometimes what happens in the future, when you have sensors in your body and you need to take care of yourself, and you really feel the urge of eating at a fast food place, uh, a thing will pop at your dashboard that healthier food options are available in about two means. What that really means is that in healthcare, as we are moving from, from static computers to mobility, what's happening is that as the data is being transferred back and forth for the first time, the patient is actually participating in it. Second, different body sensors are triggering in it. As I told people that my children will not need a driver's license uh, when they grow up, or their children will not need a driver's license. So somebody asked, why do you say that? Because by that time, the driverless car will become common. When the driverless car comes to your house, why do you need a driver's license? Similarly, people are using 3D printing to print skin and to print capillaries now, which will become the norm. At Hackensack University Medical Center, based on what I'm telling you generally, here are the specifics we are doing. We have a patient portal where the patient, we, which is web-based, which is uh, app, we're also delivering our app, which allows the patient to directly participate in his or her care, get scheduling done, questions answered, and at the same time, if the patient ends up in the ED, the alert goes to the PCP. At the same time, if the patient needs an HB1AC, which is a marker for diabetes, we don't send it to them after the date has expired. It's supposed to be done every three months. The trigger or the information goes to them about two weeks before the three-month period or 120 days. I'm sorry, I apologize. 120 day period goes away, they get the alert before, so they could do something about it. So this interaction between the doctor and the patient and the caregiver has allowed us to improve the healthcare. And of course, everybody's excited when you, uh, as, a, as a bypass, you save money on it, that makes everybody excited. But more excitement is the following, that what it has done that the readmission rate among the accountable care patients for Medicare patients and Hackensack is considerably less than other patients. And what that means is that, that the patients are taken care of well, they are managed well, they spend most of their time at home and in their community doing the things that they love instead of being in the hospital. Dan, back to you, man. Thank you so much, Dr. Rob. Um, Dr. Henderson, uh, would you like to go ahead? That sounds great. Thank you for having me. So I'm Christy Henderson. I'm the Chief Telehealth and Innovation Officer at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. And just to kind of set the frame, our, our hospital is the state's only academic medical center, so it's the largest hospital. Um, it also serves as the only trauma center, the only children's hospital for the state. So it really is... Um, from a network perspective, the go-to hospital for all complex cases. 
So uh, I'm going to share our experience and our journey through telehealth and remote patient monitoring and, um, and how we are managing the data with mobile devices. So we're all dealing with many of the same challenges. Ours here in Mississippi are no different than the rest of the nation. Um, however, you know, they may be magnified in some of the states. And, and so the reality is that we are all dealing with a healthcare workforce shortage. As our population is aging and with more chronic diseases, we're having to care for more people with less health care providers. And in rural underserved areas, the workforce that is there often doesn't operate under the latest evidence-based practice guidelines. And so it's a real challenge for these underserved areas to be able to provide coordinated care and provide quality care that helps manage uh, the health of their population. Additionally, the hospital viability is a real challenge. As we're seeing rural hospitals around the nation closing, there's a real financial crisis as we're having new pay for performance and penalties for readmissions. Everyone's trying to move from this volume-based model to a more value-based model. And so it's a real challenge in trying to deliver this care in a cost-effective way that actually improves care and, is, um, and contains the cost of those programs. Additionally, there's just a, a more complex population out there. The, the growth of chronic disease in the elderly population and people are living longer creates more of a challenge for us. And here in Mississippi, it's, it's magnified. Um, so unfortunately, we rank dead last, um, or number one, if you want to look at it the other way, and the poorest health outcomes and challenges of these chronic diseases. We're in the stroke belt. We're number one in infant mortality. And so the reality is, is that we've got a real uh, challenge on our hands. Uh, couple that with the workforce shortage of the lowest number of physicians per capita in the nation, and we really have to look at things different. And that's why telehealth, remote patient monitoring, and the use of technology is absolutely critical in a state like Mississippi and can improve efficient efficiencies as well as allow us to do provide health care in a different way. So I mentioned we were going from uh, volume to value. Well, with that comes the need for us to change our model of care to a more patient-centric approach. And so no longer can we say, these are our clinic hours, drive to this clinic, um, and come see us and sit in a waiting room and do it on our terms. It's really going to a more consumer-driven and consumer-focused model where it's about convenience, accessibility, and mobility. And we demand that in all the other areas of our lives. And the generations that are coming forward now uh, expect that, and they expect it in healthcare as well as in all the other areas of their life. And so it, we really have a challenge to change a model um, and totally turn it upside down and use technology, maintaining the quality and integrity of the program at the same time. So in many states, the concentration of the healthcare providers that are practicing in the state are all often concentrated around the academic medical center and large urban metropolitan areas which doesn't always align with where the population resides. So in Mississippi, for example, 68% of our physicians are in our large urban areas, but 60% of the population are out in the rural areas. So now we're looking at the picture and the reality that 64% of our population has to drive more than 40 minutes to get access to health care. So if you think about just the challenges in your own life, in, in your own life where you have transportation, you have health insurance, you have a health care provider, that would be difficult to throw in to say, you know, if you need to go get your regular checkup with your cardiologist, you have to drive 40 minutes. And so removing those barriers when they're not necessary um, can really result in more compliance and improved health care. So this is a, a map of Mississippi, and the green and the blue areas show where we're providing telehealth, and the white we're working on to be able to expand. But we really have a statewide operation that's been in effect now since 2003, and it was started out of a very specific need around access to emergency care in communities, and it just has evolved over these 12 years to really be um, a full-scale operation that's integrated into our healthcare system. Telehealth isn't seen as a separate department, but how a method of delivery 
for any of our specialties, of any of our services at the Academic Medical Center. So we're now in eight different types of locations, everything from connecting to hospitals and clinics, mental health centers, to rural health clinics and federally qualified health centers, schools and colleges. We even have a mobile van to take health care to people, and we connect back through telehealth to our academic medical center, um, corporations and prisons. And the most exciting one that we've just ventured into um, this over this past year is going into the patient's home. And I'm going to spend a lot more time on that toward the end of my presentation to really to, um, to highlight our use of mobile devices in, um, in telehealth. And the technology that we use for each of these programs and each of these sites is really de determined by the service that we're going to provide and in the location that we're going to go. So in some places a mobile device makes sense, as in the home, and in a clinic or a hospital we may have a wired telehealth room or an e-clinic. Um, but the solution is, is really customized to the type of service, the clinical need, and um, the ability for us to connect to that, um, that location. Here's a snapshot of where we are because it really has become a pretty large operation where we see nearly 100,000 telehealth visits per year in the eight different types of locations. We're actually, as of um, this past this month, we're at 35 medical specialties and 165 different telehealth sites of service. And so there's more endpoints than that. But the part that I want to emphasize is these are non-affiliated. They're not part of our health system. Um, two of the hospitals are part of our health system, but the rest are non-affiliated. And so with that comes disparate health systems and um, electronic medical records. So no one else uses the same electronic medical record that we do. So the challenge of integrating that and interfacing is a reality that we deal with every single day to be able to share this information, to provide continuity of care across a wide range of different types of facilities with different levels of sophistication and different levels of IT support. There's more and more demand um, every single day, it seems like, for a, a new specialty, a new location, and wherever there are people, we're building telehealth access points so that people can have access to the healthcare service that they need. We feel very strongly here that this is a partnership with the community. And as healthcare is pushing back into the community and back into the homes and into the public health sector, that hospitals and health systems are going to have to be partnered with them to be able to augment and um, enhance what services are there, but not to replace and compete. So we look at technology and healthcare in a couple different um, segments. And um, so there's everything from the portals that you have to your electronic medical record that are, are already being utilized for meaningful use. But for how we're looking at it with telehealth is it's really about consults and access to ancillary services. Everything from getting a consult with a specialist or, a specialist or a subspecialist that you don't have in your air, in your community, all the way over to non-traditional uses for the system to get access to interpreters, access to d dental services or pastoral services, ethics committees. It really is, um, it runs the whole gamut. And while we started this around access to certain healthcare specialties and medical specialties, it's really evolved to a connection and a lifeline for these communities and the hospitals and businesses where they can have access to a multitude of services to be able to make their population or their employees healthier. Um, remote patient monitoring is the other category that we look at, and this is where we put in our chronic disease management, our care at home, so how can we keep elderly patients living independently longer, and really to use this around avoiding readmissions to the hospital and avoiding ER visits. So it's really about an empowerment for patients and, and getting into the next category of personalized health. Health, And so how do patients use um, wearables or if they're wearing some type of um, sensor or device that's monitoring their activity or monitoring their compliance with medications? Um, there's all types of um, possibilities there. And integrating that into usable information is something I'll touch on in a minute. But really about personalized health care that includes more than just health care services, but really wellness and, and proactive approach. From there, we really realized quickly that because of the volume of 
complex chronic disease in our state, we had to do um, a lot of work in analytics to really have some predictive modeling and risk stratification so that we knew where it made sense for us to put our remote monitoring and um, our telehealth services and, and do that in a smart and uh, proactive uh, approach. And that really gets into our whole population health model, which is an intelligence platform to really take this information and data points from multiple disparate systems and put it into a portal where we can actually manage a large number of patients without having to have a large number of, of employees going into every health record, but to really have um, a dashboard that made sense and used analytics to um, prioritize where we needed to spend our time and tying this all into the state health information network so that we could coordinate care and prevent duplication of services. So when we started this, we really um, internally looked at tiers of health IT and so to get to a personalized healthcare model. And so in each of these tiers, I had pilot projects to really test the different solutions as we were building out our large population health program. And so the first tier is really was just around post-discharge follow-up. And so we did a project with um, patients when they left the hospital and did interactive voice response to really try to proactively um, answer questions, provide teaching and education to keep them out of the hospital during their most vulnerable time. And so that has been a huge success and one that um, we learned a great deal about of how to contact patients and do we text message and what devices do we use. Um, but it was really a, a step one for us to move into a, an evaluation of remote patient monitoring. And I'm going to highlight this program um, in more detail because this is really the crux of our entire population health program. And how do we use not only interactive voice response, but remote patient monitoring and track biometrics and, and um, evaluate the status of a patient's health um, to be able to make proactive decisions that keep them healthy and, and keep their chronic disease under control. All the way over to where we are taking um, uh, patient reported data and wearable information and ultimately putting that in there as well to be able to um, consider uh, wearable information and censored devices in that, um, in that, as a part of their medical record, really, and to make smart decisions um, using all the um, information that's available to um, evaluate the patient. And that level tier, tier three includes video visits, medication adherence, and as well as the interactive voice response and remote patient monitoring. So our telehealth call center actually operates 24 hours a day. And so one thing that we learned very early in this is that just as there's a workforce shortage in healthcare experts, there is also a shortage of technical experts out in these underserved areas. So our telehealth call center has access to both clinical and technical support, and it's one access point for any of our partner sites or anyone needing telehealth services or involved in our remote patient monitoring. And this group of experts are interacting, monitoring patients, and proactively intervening um, to be able to help improve the health of our citizens. So it's all about really saving time and reducing costs. And so we've created this um, access point where an attendant will greet um, anyone that comes in for a video visit, and they come into a virtual waiting room. And so whether it's for a stat service, for a consult with um, one of our you know, emergency medicine specialist or a stroke neurologist or a neonatologist, we can provide connection for that immediately, or we can even schedule appointments from everything from primary care um, over to, um, you know, a, a specialist with pediatric neurologist, for example. So it's really done through this one portal, and we have a virtual waiting room where patients are routed to the appropriate health care provider. And it's as simple as that there's an unmet health care need out in the community. An appointment is scheduled. The e-visit is done at a location and time that's convenient. So the patient can go to a community clinic or a hospital or one of the areas in their um, region and not have to drive to get health care. So we bring it to them. And then the treatment plan is provided. The medical record is um, also sent back to their primary medical home. And any e-prescribing can be done as needed. So we use lots of different uh, technology 
and, um, and it really has to be customized to the individual patient, the clinical service being delivered, and the location. And so we spend a lot of time testing and trying out different technology at different bandwidths to really make sure that we have a quality program that has the redundancy, privacy, and security that we need to deliver care where we need it. So remote patient monitoring for, for us is not only about an external outreach to reach patients and not have to have them drive to get health care, but it's also about an internal effort to be able to improve quality, efficiency, and safety. So even in a large academic medical center that has all the resources that it needs, the technology is used for improved efficiencies, um, improved oversight, and to really look at it from a quality standpoint and to min minimize risk um, in delivering health care in some of the most complicated patients. And, you know, one of the big areas of discussion in health system is around transitions of care and the risk that comes with when a patient moves from, say, an ICU to the floor of a hospital or even from there to a home or a nursing home facility. Um, there's a lot of risk in that handoff and transition of care, and technology can, can provide that additional layer of um, oversight and monitoring that's needed. And so we're using it both internally and externally to provide improved care, but also to provide better care and to have that coordination of care and be able to send duplicated information, not only maintained in our electronic medical record, but back to the medical home, and even have access for patients to be able to view that through their portal. And it's ultimately trying to get from a, where we're providing the tools and monitoring all the way over to where patients are empowered and able to manage their own disease and are empowered and have all the tools to be able to do that on their own. So I'm going to speak um, a little bit more detailed about our diabetes project because it really is that whole remote patient monitoring, interactive voice response, um, educational based, and it's really a, a coordinated effort that's based out of the community that our governor initiated and an effort to really try to turn around one of the uh, most complex diseases in our state that is plaguing most of our um, citizens, many of our citizens. So this is not for you to read necessarily, but to show you the complex workflow that we've created. And so we've actually done this as a full research study, and we're in the process of that now and just finished our first quarter of this because we really wanted to use this to not only show how we can improve health care through quality measures, but to look at the financial outcomes. And so this is all great if we can roll out a very complex telehealth remote monitoring program, but at what cost and would, is this something we can sustain financially? And so the studies is looking at not only the cl clinical outcomes, did we improve health, but the financial ones and operational efficiencies. And so were we able to see more patients or do have better outcomes with less people because of the technology? And then, of course, we look at the satisfaction. Was there really patient engagement? And did patients um, find this helpful? Um, and what about the health care providers? Was it seen as a threat or cumbersome, or was it something that was beneficial? And so this is um, one that we're excited to be um, uh, involved in that we will we've finished a quarter and we will monitor these patients for 12 months and so these are our most complicated diabetics in the Mississippi Delta so the most challenge from a health literacy from poverty and transportation access to care there's no endocrinologist or diabetes specialist anywhere in the county and so this is brought in telehealth remote patient monitoring as well as coordinated care and so what this workflow does is that the patients actually come in and they're given a, a telehealth uh, electronic device for their home and a glucometer. And so we give them uh, a connection through Bluetooth. So when they're monitoring their glucose at home, our nurses here in the Academic Medical Center are also monitoring them as well as their um, health care provider in the community has access. So both sides of the spectrum are being able to monitor and it's a lifeline for them. Um, they also have access to endocrinologists and ophthalmologists, dietitians and uh, diabetic educators and pharmacists all through their community. And it's an engagement um, in a daily basis with patients so that they can be empowered to manage their disease. So 
they, through their electronic tablet, they complete daily health sessions. They have personalized interventions based on branching logic of how they answered questions. We push education to them. So they have videos that will say, you know, healthy eating during Thanksgiving as a diabetic in the Mississippi Delta or encouragement and um, things that will really coach them and help them feel motivated. Um, you know, congratulations, you've done great this week kind of um, kind of announcements for them that um, becomes a real um, a friend. Um, and, and what we're hearing from the patients is that it's really a lifeline and that they feel like somebody cares. Because ultimately, it's not as simple as just take this pill and do this and that, but it's really about a behavior modification. And we've got to do this over a course of time to really change behavior and have them um, empowered to manage their disease. So the electronic tablets are, are used for a multitude of things, from everywhere from um, monitoring vital signs and their glucose to delivering educational content and video conferencing with patients, sending reminders about medications or appointments, um, as well as um, monitoring adherence to their medications. And we're monitoring um, utilization of the health system. So are they going to the ER? Are they being admitted to the hospital? And to date, none of the patients enrolled in this program have been admitted to the hospital or had to utilize the ER for any complications to their diabetes. So we're having the success that we hope to have. We're having um, significant improvement in quality indicators around diabetes. So their glucose levels are, are lowering. Their um, A1C, which is a better picture of this uh, control of their disease, are coming down from numbers as high as 14 down to 8, where we want it below 7. Um, so we're having a huge increase in compliance, but um, we're also having the outcomes that we want. And the patients are getting excited. They've been enrolled in every diabetes project they can think of and have never had their disease controlled. And now they're giving testimonies that their disease is controlled, that they're losing weight, that they're exercising, and they're encouraging other people to join, which is very exciting. So from there comes the population health, where we're using analytics to do predictive modeling, risk stratification, and targeting the high impact patients where we can really make a difference. Because it really is not about just delivering action on uh, retrospectively, seeing that there was an ER visit or they were in the hospital and then doing an intervention. But it's taking a whole picture, what's in the electronic medical record and in the health information network for your state, taking pharmacy information, claims data, and real-time remote monitoring devices and wearable data, and even information that patients can report themselves, and taking that into, to create actionable information. And so disparate information from lots of health, health um, systems as well as devices, taking it to meaningful actionable information so that an intervention can, can occur. And so the first thing I know that everyone's thinking is, well, no physician is going to want more work, and how can they manage all this data? So our Center for Telehealth is doing that for them. Based on protocols, we're managing that and giving um, and, and intervening for patients and, and giving them a lifeline and then providing uh, trendable information with actions to the physicians so that they can know what's going on with their patients. So with that, you can't, um, I can't end this without saying that it takes a lot of work and policy as well as, as well as reimbursement legislation to make this sustainable and scalable. And so Mississippi was just recently ranked in the top seven for um, in receiving a, a grade of A for its telemedicine uh, reimbursement legislation. So we now have reimbursement from both public and private payers in Mississippi to be able to deliver remote patient monitoring into the home for chronic disease. So we have a huge opportunity here, but I, I can't um, overemphasize the need for there to be multiple angles. Um, it is not just about the technology, but also the workflow, the people, and the legislation and reimbursement policies um, to be able to have this scalable and sustainable to be able to make an impact at the scale that it needs to, to be able to turn around the healthcare system. Thank you, I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Dr. Henderson. Um, I just wanted to remind the audience uh, that to please submit any questions that you might have um, using the Q&A box at the right of your window. Um, okay, uh, now uh, Steve, uh, if you want to go ahead. Sure, thanks a lot. And thank you, Dr. Henderson. That was, uh, that was absolutely fascinating. Um, my name is Steve Fallon. I've, uh, I'm the Senior Product Manager here at NetMotion Wireless. And 
our piece of this entire telehealth uh, uh, equation is all about connectivity. Um, you know, we've been more than 15 years in the enterprise mobility space. We've helped a million critical mobile workers stay connected to the systems that they need to stay connected to. And our vision is to deliver a, deliver a foundation on which um, people like telehealth providers and, and other critical aspects of our society can build solutions that are, are improving the life of the, uh, improving the life of the, the populations that they serve. This is a sample of some of the industries uh, that, uh, that, that we, we play in. You can see we've got a lot of healthcare and life sciences customers. Um, very, very proud of this list, and we're very proud of the, uh, the work that we're doing, uh, we're doing uh, along with healthcare. We are absolutely fascinated and in love with the idea of telemedicine. So um, with that having been said, uh, we spend a lot of time talking to customers, and a lot of time talking to other people around these uh, sort of general problems, and there's a couple of things that we've learned. Um, you know, there's some challenges out there, some practical challenges when it comes to implementing some of these programs. Um, productivity is key. I mean, you've heard Dr. Henderson and Dr. Rob uh, both mention that um, financial metrics and succeeding with the financial metrics is, is one of their goals as they're adopting these new programs. Um, we know from practical experience that unless that underlying technology has a reliable, solid connection to the Internet, that um, the productivity of any clinician in the field is going to be negatively, impact, uh, negatively impacted. Um, we know that from an IT perspective, um, the folks that are actually supporting the networks and apps in the field need to know what's going on. If they don't have solid information to resolve any problems, not only is it slowing mobile clinicians down and slowing down the, the benefits of telehealth, it's increasing uh, clinician frustration, and they always find themselves reacting to something rather than being able to predict or see a problem as it's emerging and, and jump in a little and be proactive a little like uh, the telehealth analytics that both Dr. Henderson and Rob uh, mentioned. Um, and the third element is when we look at what it takes to implement telehealth, um, we quickly discover that in almost all cases you are using networks that you do not necessarily control, whether that's a carrier network, um, whether you're using a, uh, you know, a public Wi-Fi in a, in a remote clinic, uh, whether you're using uh, somebody's home internet connection. Um, so from an administrative standpoint and from a, a HIPAA privacy standpoint, uh, this, is a, this is a big concern. And so the IT crews uh, and the folks that are paying attention to, to, this, uh, you know, to, to these emerging trends always have to keep in the back of their mind that the our environment is complex and security, is a, uh, security and usability are, are paramount. That last point is, uh, is, is very important because we know and have heard from many clinicians in the field that if, if any given application, and, and that includes ours, is not easy to use, is not functionally transparent, um, they won't use it. Uh, they'll bypass it in some way. And so one of our goals is to sort of just be in the background and always be there, always be on, always doing our job. Because you know, as one of them put it, it's like you know, I'm a I, I'm a nurse. I'm not an IT person. You need something that's that's appropriate for me to use. So those are the challenges. Um, we know in general that connectivity is king. Um, 4G is becoming more ubiquitous, um, and uh, public Wi-Fi is uh, the use of public Wi-Fi in many places is actually decreasing. So as these lines become faster and more reliable that you get from the carrier, there's less of a reliance on, on public Wi-Fi. Um, we also know that uh, home broadband is, uh, is increasing in penetration, um, and that 23% of their people um, are using, uh, using their home broadband, and that is, a, that is a, a shift as well for when it comes to providing, uh, providing telehealth and telehealth access. Um, Real-time access to data is key. We've talked to customers who are implementing um, in-home video and video diagnostics, and for them, being able to have, you know, a strong connection and a reliable connection uh, is is paramount. It literally is the difference between success and failure of their product. So, 
the networks environments are growing more complex, and the use and mix of uh, 4G, uh, LTE, uh, home wireless, and home broadband is shifting. The drive in order for telehealth to be successful, obviously, is going to be towards more stability. So this is what it breaks down from as uh, an, an energy, le uh, uh, an industry perspective. We've done some research. Um, the, the number one concern of the people that are implementing these mobile, mobile data deployments is really all about connectivity reliability. Number two is security. Um, number three is control costs. They know that it doesn't do any good to control the cost if you don't have a secure and reliable connection to actually accomplish what it is you want to do. Um, and then, of course, number four would be uh, visibility and proactive management. Uh, the study was carried out here by a Rasavi Research um, from over 400 IT professionals around the world um, in, in all manner of verticals and all of them with field service deployments, which uh, look a lot like telehealth, where you've got people going out into the field and doing you know, real work with real data it's, you know, beyond just reading email. So a great case in point where we've succeeded as a company is, uh, is Alina Healthcare up in Minnesota. Um, their clinicians are using wireless laptops and tablets, whether they're connecting over a carrier network or the, uh, the in-hospital Wi-Fi. They were seeing frequent dropped connections that was impacting the stability of their applications that they needed for their own telehealth initiatives. Um, and some of the staff were getting so frustrated that they were quitting. So clearly the mobile deployment is at jeopardy if it's not supporting the needs of the, the people in the field. Uh, they deployed uh, mobility. Um, they also uh, got our policy management and our analytics modules, which gives them a great deal more control and visibility into what's happening on those mobile networks. Um, and as a result, uh, their trouble tickets uh, on, a, uh, on, a, on, a, on a monthly basis dropped to, to next to nothing. Um, and the improvements in efficiency meant that their patient visits were able to increase by 50%. Um, they had faster time to treat in the emergency room, um, and they were able to adopt more of a uh, hands-off um, management policy, so that you know the same number of uh, the same number of IT crew could uh, go ahead and support a much larger population of uh, mobile health workers, and you know to find new applications for this technology within within their health system. So uh, great, uh, great success story there, and we're, we're very pleased to have been um, a part of turning that around for them. So that was what I wanted to share with you today. Um, I guess, Dan, I turn it back over to you to, uh, to take any questions. Yep, thank you so much, Steve. Um, all right, yeah, now, as Steve said, uh, we're going to move on to the Q&A. Uh, we have lots of great questions, uh, and we will try to get to as many as possible. Um, our first question, um, and I believe it's for uh, uh, Dr. Henderson, um, has, uh, has, has reimbursement been an issue with any of, the, of your specific efforts, with any of the efforts that you, uh, that you discussed? Yes, it has. Um, when we started all these programs back 12 years ago, there was no reimbursement, and so we built our business plan around contracts with other hospitals and clinics. And, and so we had a business model that was not dependent on grants. Um, while we love the grants and it allowed us to be able to um, deploy new technology and, and, and really be able to scale it up quicker, um, we didn't want to be dependent on grants. And so we were working very hard through the years to create um, really a grassroots effort to see the benefits of this from outcomes and from economic development side so that um, in the last two years um, telehealth legislation was passed in our state to allow for full reimbursement at the same rate as in-person care from all of our public and pri private payers in the state. So now we really have um, the the business plan to scale this up and really make a difference. And so remote patient monitoring is the latest legislation that was passed, and, um, and that's really a, it was a remarkable feat. And not only did we pass it with you know, we had no dissents in the vote from our uh, legislators. So it was a, uh, a huge um, testament to 
the impact that it's had on our um, the health of our state and access to care and um, to the community. So it was really not necessarily having to be the academic medical center asking for this, but the communities were asking for this to be passed as well. So um, critical to the success of any telehealth program will be finding the reimbursement model that will sustain it. Great, thank you. Um, our next question, I believe it's for uh, Dr. Rob. Um, what, uh, Dr. Rob, what has been the, uh, the patient response um, to, the, uh, to the Hackensack Alliance um, ACU's uh, tablet initiative? Um, they, I know you briefly mentioned it in your presentation. Um, are the patients enthusiastic about it? Well, you know, in the beginning, uh, let me put it this way, first time the patients, uh, in inpatient when they saw uh, the nursing staff using the uh, smart devices, uh, to do medicates, uh, med uh, MAR, and uh, they thought that everybody was texting. And uh, they did not like it that, uh, that the healthcare people are not paying attention to them. So once we educated the patient and showed them what they were doing, they got interested in it, and uh, then they wanted to participate in it. Similarly, when we went to their homes and uh, we started taking information in it, uh, it was only uh, us doing the work and they looking at us. So that was okay, not great. Once the patients got access to the portal and once the uh, patients start uh, putting their own schedule and when the patients start looking at their own data themselves, then the enthusiasm level increased to such an extent that uh, if a loved one is in the hospital, and, uh, some, and their loved ones can see the data from their home, they started sending secure text message to the nurse saying that why have you not given this medication? It was due at eight o'clock. So we started getting complaints from the nurses, can you turn this off? Or from the health care givers. Uh, so what I, and in a nice way, of course, laughing and joking about it, what that really means is that uh, as, the, as the program progressed, the uh, interaction between the uh, caregivers and the interaction between the uh, patients increased and it created a, a trusted environment where both parties are working very well. Interesting, interesting. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, um, uh, I, I, I guess uh, our next question, um, uh, what uh, um, what has been the uh, the impact uh, on 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 quality uh, uh, on care quality from from that from that? So program? what happens is that uh, there are patient reported outcomes. That means uh, the patient uh, reports based on their uh, whether they were they slept well last night, whether they were intimate, whether they went shopping or not. If it's an oncology patient, so in return the physician tries to understand and gauge the medication, understand and gauge the treatment. So the quality of life of the patient is, is enhanced or maintained. So to answer your question, because of this interaction, the overall quality improves, quality of life improves, and the quality of care improves. At the same time, readmission to the hospital, revisit to the hospital decreases, and the patient has a, has a real time, real lifetime with their family rather than spending time in the waiting rooms, rather than spending time in the ED, rather than spending time in the, in the hospital bed. You see, so to answer your question, uh, that the quality of life improves, at the same time, of course, everybody looks at cost, so the cost of care also decreases, and uh, it's a win-win for both. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Rob, another question for you. Um, uh, how is how is patient health information secured uh, from the mobile devices to the to the health centers? You know, HIPAA? so uh, I mean, uh, we're not allowed to use vendor names and things like that. So there are multiple vendors outside. Uh, like uh, our speaker before me spoke about, you know, in this world, connectivity is very important. But after connectivity, security is paramount. That means uh, there are uh, ways, encrypted ways. To, and secure ways of sending information from one end to the other end. So we, ha we are employing those techniques that have been given to us 
and the software that has been given to us on our tablets that allows the secure communication between the uh, caregiver and the uh, and the patient. If people are interested in it, they can send you an email and I can tell you which companies we use and we can tell you that. Thank you, Dr. Rob. Um, speaking of uh, security, um, uh, our next question is for, uh, uh, I believe it's for Steve. Um, uh, is, is mobility HIPAA compliant? Uh, it, it is. We've got, a, uh, we've got a large body of healthcare providers, both uh, mobile clinicians and on-campus hospital deployments who, uh, who are using us as part of their, uh, part of their, HIPAA, their HIPAA program. Uh, and another question for Steve. Um, uh, it, it, Steve mentioned uh, complaints of frequent dropped connections. Uh, you mentioned uh, that in your last slide. Uh, how can that be addressed with Wi-Fi uh, or cellular? cellular? That's, a, that's a great question because it speaks to um, who is responsible for what elements in sort of the chain of connectivity that makes telehealth possible at, at all. Um, obviously, if you're deploying an on-campus Wi-Fi solution, uh, whether it's uh, for public access or whether it's restricted to hospital staff, um, you have tools at your disposal that you can use to tune the network for your environment. Um, inevitably, what we've found is that there are some there are some pieces of equipment that don't want Wi-Fi anywhere near them, uh, and so that creates a uh, that creates a problem if ubiquitous coverage is one of your goals for your campus Wi-Fi deployment. If you're talking about carrier networks, well, obviously you don't control them at all, and the environment is still something with which you need to contend. Um, one of the things that, uh, that mobility does is smooth out those areas where you would have coverage gaps so that um, you know, the user experience, uh, the application stability um, is not impaired as you, you, know, as you move through them. Um, for example, you know, home architecture uh, of all things can uh, can be a uh, can be a problem when it comes to wireless signals. Uh, if you've got a lot of metal in uh, in the walls, obviously that's going to bounce radio around. Whereas if you don't, or you're near a cell tower, uh, your uh, you know your patients probably got better wireless access in their home. Uh, thanks, Steve. Um, I believe this question uh, is, is more of a toss up. Um, uh, so I'll just ask, and whoever wants to answer can chime in first. Um, has there been any insight uh, from auditing controls for adverse patient events uh, and interference uh, and tampering with uh, sensor output? Uh, does anybody want to take a crack at that one? This is Steve. I'm. We're far from experts here, but we do talk to a lot of people. My suspicion is is that there has been adverse impact that um, that there has been sensor tampering, uh, which is you know sort of gotten into the into the health records. Um, but we've got no direct uh, we've got no direct experience or or data to confirm that or the uh, or or the nature of it. Um, but I, I mean it'd be, it would be hard to say that you know no one has ever um, you know played with their sensor or let a grandkid accidentally get a hold of a, you know, of a sensor or something like that from a, a home health perspective. I don't know, maybe Dr. Henderson or Dr. Rob has got some more, more specific or practical experience. Well, the only thing I would add to this, this is, uh, Christy, um, is that because our model is really a coordinated care effort, we're, we're engaging with the patients often daily. And so we know these patients and, um, and so if it's, it's a normal reading, for example, but then they're in the emergency room or they're hospitalized. We know there's there's some issues with, you know, whether it's been tampered with or malfunctioning or whatever it is. And there is all types of, of things to um, test equipment and have uh, routine maintenance done to them to make sure that they are accurate. Um, but, you know, it really is more than just a, a straight upload of information and data points. It really is no different than in an inpatient or in the hospital 
when you see the cardiac monitor flatlining and they're talking to you, you know that there's a device problem. So it really has to be put with the clinical scenario and more information than just making a decision based on one upload of a data point from a home setting. I think that's very really nicely said, uh, Dr. Anderson. Uh, the only thing that I can add to it is that suppose this was real and somebody gained instead of three pounds, somebody gained 20 pounds in a day. Uh, what that really means is that either the uh, cardiac problem went really bad or the patient uh, has developed SITs or something like that, right? So in this thing, there's a protocol for that. Like if the, if the, if the uh, weight is more than three pounds, you get a consult. Uh, and uh, or if, if it's more than uh, 10 pounds, you have to go to the ED. So there is a there's a protocol already set for safeguards. But uh, the whoever asked this question is a very intelligent question. Is that uh, we should be aware of this. Uh, but at the same time, when we first uh, somebody gets a, a device, there are a QCs done on it. And like Dr. Anderson said, that we know our patients. So we know that that last time they had a HB1AC of seven, all of a sudden it cannot be three. Uh, that means that that person is in a diabetic uh, uh, hypoglycemia. I mean, the person should be dead uh, while we are talking to them. So, but uh, whoever asked this question, it's an intelligent question. It's something under biosafety. We should uh, look into it and keep a log of it. Uh, thank you, all, all three of you, for uh, for uh, for taking a crack at that one. Um, that's uh, that's going to be our last question. Uh, we have had lots of great questions today, and unfortunately, we we were not able to get to them all. Uh, but we will be getting back to everyone who submitted personally after the webinar. Uh, thank you for attending this fierce live webinar and submitting so many great questions. I'd like to thank our speakers for participating and NetMotion Wireless for sponsoring today's webinar. Uh, this webinar has been recorded, uh, and you will be able to access the recording within 24 hours on the same page you used to register for the event. Uh, thank you again for joining, and we look forward to seeing you at future events.